Hello and welcome to another episode of Thoughts Per Episode, House of a Dragon Edition. Today, we've got a time skip, and I love a time skip. Usually I like the time skip because it's like an anime thing and you get to see all the characters age up, wear new outfits and have extra powerful moves. Uh, but this is Game of Thrones and it was more like, instead of like the usual two or three year time skip, it was like a ten year time skip and we changed actors and I was very concerned about how I'd feel without Millie Alcock and Emily Carey. And I must say it's not like a one to one, it's not like a case of wow, these characters, you you wouldn't even notice that they're changed actors if you didn't know about it, it's not like that. But I don't think it's meant to be. I think, uh, as opposed to something like The Crown, uh, where they're changing out the actors every two seasons because it's based on real history and the people really age, I think that while this is also to do with ageing, obviously, it's also to do with showing how the characters have changed. Alison is a lot different now. She's a lot more cynical, a lot more angry, a lot more scheming uh, as compared to the Alicent we knew from 10 years prior. I feel like when Alicent came out in the previous episode with her green dress, that was really the beginning of the Alicent we know now. She no longer talks like this, oh no, things are happening. She's now more like, you know, well okay, this is happening. <laughs> You know, on like a base level like that, she's a lot more firm, she's a lot more authoritative. Um, and you get the sense, especially in the small council meeting, that the kingdom is mostly being run um, by her and Princess Rhaenyra. Rhaenyra is also older um, and she's also changed, she's more kind of worn down by family, you get the impression in this episode. Although actually it's slightly unfair to say that because the episode opens with her being a fucking badass and you know when Alicent's like I want to see the baby uh, and we learn why she wants to see the baby later, um, she's like I'm fucking going with even though she's literally just given birth like Jesus Christ. The episode opens by saying yeah she's a mother now she's still a fucking badass, in fact most mothers are. We learn through insinuation instead of outright being shown this time that she's having an affair and that the kids are of uh, what's his face strong and of course those rumours base the whole political thing that this episode is based on. Alison is worried for her kids that when Rhaenyra takes the crown she's going to put her kids to death because her father instilled that fear into her. Um, I don't think Rhaenyra would but she's definitely, Alison's definitely been brought up in this cruel unforgiving world where horrible things can happen to innocent people as did to her so I'm not surprised that she believes this uh, whereas Rhaenyra's paranoia is more to do with the fact that the children are very obviously not Targaryen or Valarian I guess they are Targaryen they're half Targaryen but the strong DNA too strong and everyone can see it it's just like you'd have to be blind or Viserys to not notice what's going on there but yeah I love the change in dynamic especially in a small council meeting where you can see that mostly the affairs are argued between Rhaenyra and Alicent like those are the two key political figures in that room who are basically making the decisions and just filtering it through Viserys who just wants to please everyone because of course he does what has he learned in 10 years one little thing I liked about this episode and I'm kind of jumping through it randomly as I remember things instead of going through it scene by scene this time because there was a lot of smaller scenes compared to some of the previous episodes I would say where it's been more like a block of this and a block of that and a block of that one of the things I really appreciated about this episode is it showed that Rhaenyra is still kind uh, because while her lover gets sent away by Robert Strong, uh, is his name Robert Strong? Fuck, I should really know this by now. While he gets sent away, uh, and Rhaenyra wants to flee to Dragonstone with Lainor, um, you know, you can see, like, the shot where Lainor looks to his boyfriend, and they look a bit like, oh my god, we're being split up now too. At the very end of the scene, she turns to him and goes, oh no, bring him, obviously. Uh, um, we need every sword we can get, obviously. That was just a nice little touch. Like you could see Rhaenyra being like, "Well, I had to, I had to be separated from my lover, so fuck you. You have to be separated from yours." But no, it shows that even after all these years later, perhaps she feels some level of guilt over what happened to Joffrey. I finally remembered his name. His name was Joffrey because even when Lena names uh, the new strong kid, uh, sorry, <clears throat> the new Valarian kid, Joffrey. Um, well, she's like, at first she's like, why the hell didn't you consult me before we did this? She's angry he didn't consult her, but she does go along with it. She is like, yeah, he's called Joffrey. It's a nice little sign that shows that even though we've skipped 10 years ahead past what happened at the end of the last episode, 
you know, it's not like it's been forgotten. And while it's not being openly addressed because it happened 10 years ago and it's not exactly strictly relevant now, um, it is still part of this story and it is still in the back of the characters' minds and it is still informing their actions. By the way, Kristen Cole still knocking around. He's just kind of become a straight up asshole, huh? It seems like he's let his uh, anger uh, fester. So while he had some level of guilt at the end of the last episode, since then he seems to have, uh, I guess when you've got to live with what you've done, you kind of justify things to yourself. So he does not like Rhaenyra anymore. He calls her, does he call her a cunt? He calls her something horrible. And even Alison stops and looks at him like, dude. And he's like, oh, I'm sorry, that was unbecoming of me. You also see how he is as a tutor, and he is harsh and unforgiving and neglectful specifically to Rhaenyra's children. And he perpetuates the role Rhaenyra's beauty has had up in the series until now uh, by kind of causing violence to break out wherever she goes, but now wherever he has influence. Uh, like, he basically insults that strong dude. Uh, I really need to learn his name. It's Harwin, isn't it? Harwin Strong? Harwin Breakbones? He insults her, him to his face. He insults his honour. Uh, he basically outs him as being the father of these kids and stuff like that. It's a shame we didn't get any outright confrontation between Rhaenyra and Kristen, but I'm sure they've had ten years worth of scornful hallway glances. Laris fucking Clubfoot. If I did not watch Alt Shift X, I would not have known that this would be a guy to watch out for. Just a quick reminder, by the way, he's called Laris Clubfoot, but his his last name is Strong. He is the brother of Harwin and the son of a Hand of a King. Uh, and he, he kills them. I shouldn't be surprised, this is Thrones, but in a very uh, opaque move to show us that he is not loyal to his family. He is loyal to the people who give him power. Uh, he basically takes Alicent's wish to be rid of the Strongs and uh, gets a bunch of convicts. Say, look, if you let me cut your tongues out so you can't tell anyone uh, who sent you, uh, then you can go and do a fire for me and be free afterwards. Uh, you can serve the realm, wink wink. Which is a terrible idea, by the way, because they still have their fingers. They could just write down what happened. I guess you could say it's more symbolic than anything, and, like, he's... He's also asserting his power over them, like, I mutilated you, what will I do to you if you fucking write down what we've talked about? I will do far worse to you. But yeah, he basically gets a bunch of convicts to burn down a strong castle. I don't know why I'm relaying the offence of a story to you, you've already seen the episode or you wouldn't be able to listen to this. Watching this, listening to this, I don't know what I'm saying anymore. Words keep coming out of my mouth and I cannot stop them. But yeah, fascinating dynamics all around. Damon, we see how Damon's doing, he's in Essos, he's chilling, he's considering getting into politics. We see his wife, Lena? There's Lena and there's Lena, right? They have... It's not a loveless marriage, uh, but it's also not exactly perfect. We see that, as in all things, Damon's uh, true feelings are a little bit cloudy, but I love how Lena basically fucking calls him out, saying, you keep telling me you don't care about these things, but you're in the library reading about these things all day, and he's like, I didn't know you'd been watching me. Well, Lena sadly dies in childbirth, uh, which would be a bit random if it wasn't already part of written law. Uh, and I think, you know, when you're writing down fire and blood, uh, like the family trees, you've got to account for what happens to every single family member, and that's what happens to her, and they had to put that in somewhere. But also, it is symbolically similar to what happened to Emma, and now Damon is left feeling similar to how Viserys felt. Although, interestingly, Damon, who is... Uh, said to be vicious and cruel, or shown to be vicious and cruel and stronger in those ways than Viserys is. Whereas Viserys was like, yeah, cut the baby out of a womb, even if it will kill my wife. Damon couldn't do it, and you saw Lena run away from the birthing room in great pain to her dragon to tell the dragon basically to kill her and put her out of her pain. That is a super interesting thing, because throughout the series we've been shown the cruelty of trying to be kind and letting things fester because you don't want to cause conflict. And normally, you'd imagine Viserys would do this move, but instead Daemon does it. It's a weird kind of yin-yang situation where yin has a tiny bit of yang and yang has a tiny bit of yin. Um, it's kind of like that. One last thing I want to mention before I finish talking about this episode is that in this episode, towards the end, in the sequence where we are getting the Laris Clubfoot voiceover and it's building tension and it's swapping between scenes of first Rhaenyra fleeing to Dragonstone, then Viserys 
basically mourning his wife Emma from like picking up her old wedding ring and obviously going on to what happens with the fire that shot of Viserys where he's got the two rings on his finger and we are watching him from between books in a bookcase or something like that or like things on a shelf uh, and it just shows like his grief he's constantly putting on like a brave face and like a cheerful face but he seems to be depressed and feeling very alone in his sickness um and as king viserys typically doesn't get much time in these episodes to kind of like be the focal center of things because he's not the focal center of things anymore he's a king but as i mentioned earlier the realm is basically being managed through his daughter and his wife arguing with each other but there is a shot and it is one of my favorite shots in all of game of thrones where he notices the mouse running across his fireplace and he looks up at it, and the look on his face is some fucking top-notch acting, I swear to god. It just conveys everything he is feeling in his age, in his sickness, in his grief, uh, and seeing that rat and being like, whoa, what? Why is there a rat in here? Like, the kind of- everything that symbolises, like, his kingdom is decaying, maybe him finally realising that his kingdom is decaying, all this, but just- just in general. I wish I could take a screenshot of it, but anti-piracy measures are so fucking asshole -ish these days. I cannot take a screenshot of it. I hope someone else does. I don't know how other people get clips from Game of Thrones, but I have tried several ways. But man, just that fucking the look on his face. Ah, oh, what an actor. Jeez. Anyway, yeah, you can fucking tell a story with a facial expression and some really good makeup teams anyway that's gonna do it for this episode thank you very much for listening let me know what you thought down below leave a like if you liked the video and come back next week for another one thank you bye